So thank you very much. This is a tremendous privilege and a great honor to be here and um, to join my um, very esteemed colleagues um, who, from whom I know I will learn some very important truths. So let's see. Okay, so the title of my talk is Uncomfortable Truths. And my aim of this talk is to make you feel uncomfortable. So I'm going to give you that right up front. And if you're not getting uncomfortable by what I'm saying um, by the end of this talk, uh, then I haven't done my job. So there are going to be some uncomfortable truths, but it's important that we face these truths if we're going to actually build more inclusive and more diverse um, human endeavors of any kind, but we're talking about research here. I always start my talks anywhere in the world, and I've given talks in the last 12 months in Australia, the UK, um, the US, um, and uh, other parts of the world. I always start off with where I do my work, which is here in downtown Toronto. And this is our land acknowledgement, our institutional land acknowledgement that recognizes that this land has been occupied and taken care of for many millennia, tens of thousands of years, by people who are often not represented in the room. And there's our first uncomfortable truth. Why are those people who have been here much longer than many of us, I'm an immigrant, I'm a proud immigrant, come from another part of the world, as you can tell, but I don't have brown skin. I have white skin, which gives me a huge amount of privilege. So compared to people who have been living here for many thousands of years. So I think that's an important thing to recognize. Why aren't these people uh, included in many of our activities? Why are our genome-wide association studies often biased, missing communities, missing populations, missing people that we can uh, strive, we should be striving to help? The Toronto is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. It's a treaty that uh, bound the Mississaugas, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe uh, to come together and protect the land and share the territory. Many other people have come into this treaty, and it says here, invited into this treaty, and I don't think they were. So land acknowledgements are living documents. They are continually iterative, and very importantly, they are challenges to action. So the foundational principles of peace, friendship, and respect are very good principles when we're thinking about equity, diversity, and inclusion. But more importantly, the land acknowledgements are a call to action, a call to action, and they are a challenge to everybody in the room. What are you going to do in response to the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? And how can you do that within a scientific type of setting? That's hard work. But we are, we are charged, we are challenged to do that hard work. My response to my response to that call, of, to call to action is to amplify, is to commit to amplifying the voices and valuing the contributions and celebrating the achievements of, of a diverse uh, collection of women in research. And here are some of those women because those individuals often don't get the invitations to speak, as, as Sharon mentioned, because those women often aren't the first people that come to mind when somebody says, I need somebody to speak to something. So my job, my privilege, and everybody in this room has tremendous privilege, my job, my responsibility is to do something about using my privilege um, to support, to promote other people. So here is Juliet Daniel, that you might know from McMaster. She is, um, I just want to make sure this is the right, okay, I don't know where it's going. She is, on the left here, she is a researcher whose uh, lived experience as an, an, um, a Caribbean Canadian woman uh, informs her research. So she has identified a unique genetic risk for triple negative breast cancer in women of African ancestry. We might not have discovered that, but very important finding were it not for her bringing those ideas and those, those concepts and those uh, perspectives to her work. Melanie Goodchild is an Anishinaabe scholar. She's working with the massive geosp geospatial data sets that NASA has to look at food security and food vulnerability, particularly in, <laughs> particularly in um, First Nations populations that are going to be more, most at risk from climate change. So bringing her perspective to an, a really, really important problem. There is Eugenia Duodo, some of you might be familiar with, who describes very, very elegant, uh, eloquently her experience as the only young woman of color in the chemistry graduate program at the University of Toronto. So imagine the ability for her to contribute to the full extent that she might want to be or have the talent to contribute in a research setting when she looks around and she doesn't see anybody who looks like her in her entire career pathway. 
She's now a very, very successful leading a not-for-profit bringing science experiences to marginalized youth. And this is Deanna Burgett, who is a Cree Dene. She is, def defines herself as an indigeneer. She is an engineer. She has a background in engineering, pipeline engineering. And she's the first indigenous engineer in residence at uh, Schulich School of Engineering in Calgary. So these are really talented people that bring really important perspectives to research who are often overlooked because of what they look like, where they come from, other factors that have nothing to do with their ability. It's really important to recognize in Canada, and we are not honest with ourselves in Canada. We are not having this conversation, maybe more in the last couple of weeks, but we must, in academia, in the scientific enterprise, recognize that we are as racist, sexist, and homophobic, ageist, ableist, as many other parts of the world. Many parts of the world that we look to and say, well, we're not like them. Actually, we are because we're human beings. We are flawed. We are fundamentally flawed, deeply flawed. We bring cultural baggage with us. We bring our identities. We're not bad people, but we are human beings. And so we really need to be honest about this and recognize that this is an uncomfortable truth that exists as much in the academy and in scientific endeavors as it does in other parts of the world, other parts of activities. So I go across the country talking to uh, universities, often um, research settings, departments of biology or science or engineering or whatever, and I hear stories, and I could give you binders and binders of stories of, um, of uh, impacts that those kinds of attitudes, which are often just below the surface, they can be explicit, but sometimes they're implicit, but they're very real. Um, so I collect those, people come and tell me. But this is one, this one here is just a statement that was in a newsletter from the medical physics community. I gave a talk to their national conference, international conference last year. There was a newsletter came out and it's a description from um, Rowan Thomas, who is a Canada research chair in physics at Carleton, describing an experience following Donna Strickland's um, award for the Nobel Prize last fall. A respected scientist remarked his surprise that another world-class renowned male optics expert had been overlooked, quote, maybe because he was not a woman. So I want to be really clear that these things go on. People say these things out loud. And if they're saying them out loud, how many people are thinking them? So this is the culture. This is the situation that is real. It's real in Canada. We don't want to look at it. It's uncomfortable, but it's there. I can tell you there's a very strong whisper network in Canada of who to work with, where to go. There are issues that come up. It's there. Lots of tons and tons of good stuff. But let's also shine some light on some of the things that are limiting our ability to leverage all the human talent. Queens, as you may be aware, um, very uh, appropriately and courageously now requires all the med students to learn about their historic ban on black students. So Queen's University, 100 years ago, actually was quite progressive. It had students of color in its medical program. And then post-First post World War, there was a sort of a backlash to people from other countries. They actually asked students of color who were already in the program to leave. This is Canada, OK? And you might think, oh, that's a long time ago. Things are much better now. Well, this is just from last year. Um, this is an individual in science, in the life sciences, who has, after a long investigation, been removed from the system. He's actually had research funding withdrawn, federal research funding withdrawn, because of an ongoing situation relating to sexual harassment in that setting. Okay. So we have challenges, and we have realities, and they're uncomfortable. But the only way to deal with them is to shed light on them. And when we don't deal with them, then we're going to fail to attract talent. Importantly, we're going to fail to retain talent. And I can't tell you how many stories I've heard about people leaving the system, leaving science. We don't leverage all of our talent. People can't bring their full selves to work. They're not comfortable. They don't feel safe. And we miss good science. We miss good ideas. We miss good, good suggestions. We miss rigorous experimental design. So this is our collective problem. This is not the problem of the those groups. It's our collective problem. These are just some of the comments. And I put these out there because I want us to feel uncomfortable. I want you to know that these are things that people hear. Somebody in Toronto, I always hire girls in the lab because they work harder and I can pay them less. Somebody, a professor, actually said that to another professor, a woman. It's like, I mean, I don't know if it's worse to say it out loud and you know, think it. I mean, it just it astounds me. A colleague, uh, a young gay man who describes that his life 
um, and the anxiety he felt every Monday morning going into the lab. So this is a, a sort of a pharmacological setting, going into the lab. Every Monday morning, because he continued, had to edit himself. His lab mates, his, his community didn't know that he was gay. Every morning when people said, what did you do on the weekend? What did you talk about? Where did you go see a movie? Every time he had to edit himself and think about how he was going to say things until the point at which he came out. Tremendous support. Everybody embraced him. But the, the reality of the anxiety and the exhaustion of having to continually edit himself actually had led him to serious mental health issues. People can't bring their full selves to work. They can't give their best work. Uh, yeah, woman of color interviewing at a Canadian university. This is one I just heard in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I was advised by a male member of the search committee that I should not join the department because women were not appreciated. Um, I was told by another faculty member, they just bring women in, into interview to satisfy EDI, but they don't offer them the position. So these are real things that represent attitudes that are sort of systemic and structural. And it's not just gender, it's across like um, all intersectionalities, gender, race, ethnicity. Um, and it's not just gender binary. We have systemic issues that limit our ability to leverage talent. And this is a really serious problem because Canada is a small population, a small population, a big country. We have big competitors out there, the US, China, Brazil, big, big populations, lots of people. We're a small population in a big country. We need to leverage every single ounce of human intellectual capital and human intellectual capital is our biggest resource. So this is the president of the World Bank saying in developed countries, the majority of the future growth is going to come as a consequence of the resource which is represented by human capital. That means brain power. And every time I hear about a student, a young person, a person of color, a person from LGBTQ community, um, leaving, deciding against pursuing a career, saying, I don't want to have to deal with that. I don't want to have to deal with that toxic environment. I think I'll go into commerce, not math. I'll go into um, psychology, not biology. All of those things mean that we're losing potential intellectual talent. And that's our resource. We can't afford to do that because we're a small population. I just want to remind everybody as well that we often hear in this country a lot about women in science, girls in science, women in science. There's an Elevate conference going on around there. And it's really important to keep in mind that women are not a single homogeneous group. In fact, women are not a diversity group. They're not a diversity group. They are half the population of the globe. So we need to keep in mind that women come in all shapes and sizes, just like men do. And this happened to be a panel I did at the Canadian Science Policy Conference a couple of years ago. And you can see, and here's Mahadeo Sukai, who I mentioned to you before, who literally wrote the book. There is the book on creating a culture of accessibility because people with disabilities are the most underemployed, but have incredible intellectual um, contributions that, that we need to leverage. Um, here is a you know, collection of, of women in science, successful women, and there am I with all my white privilege and my, all my advantages, even though I can tell you stories about the things I've had to deal with. Um, but nothing compared to what Melanie Goodchild as an indigenous scholar, perhaps the smartest person I've ever met, or Shohini Ghosh, one of the few women of color who is a computer science physics professor in Canada. There's like nine of them or 10 of them. So, or uh, Hilary Lappin Scott, who is an academic leader from the UK who speaks to the issues around age and the, women, the way women are viewed in relation to age and ability. All of these intersections, all of these differences um, need to be recognized. It's not that we don't want to see gender or we don't want to see color. We want to see humanity in all its glorious diversity and recognize the whole value of all these different perspectives that all of these different experiences and backgrounds and, and uh, 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 cultural experiences can bring to the human endeavor that we're interested in, science research. So we need to embrace all of our human dimensions. One particular challenge with scientists is they think they're objective, forgetting that they're human. Scientists are not objective. Scientists are human. But scientists are trained to understand and, and review and critically analyze bodies of scholarship and bodies of data. And when they do that, they actually become better scientists. So one thing that we really need to do with our scientific community and our scientific enterprise is educate people on the massive body of scholarship and data to say, yeah, we're biased. 
we're human, we're flawed, learn to recognize it, learn to interrupt it, learn to correct for it, just as you would recalibrate a machine in the lab if it was 5% miscalibrated. You wouldn't just let it go and say, it's always been that way. <laughs> this is uncomfortable, and you should feel uncomfortable because everybody should be checking their own privilege, everybody should be checking their own biases. You are all in this room biased in different ways, not because you're bad people, but because you're human beings. So embrace your humanity. But it's an uncomfortable thing to do. Hold a mirror up to yourself, hold a mirror up to your board, hold a mirror up to your institution, hold a mirror up to your division, hold a mirror up to your policies, processes. Look at the things that are systemic structural barriers. Have the uncomfortable conversations. Sarah Kaplan and Sonia Kang at the University of Toronto Rotman School of Business have done a ton of work about diversity and discomfort. And there's a ton of data out there to show that actually discomfort is part of the process leading to innovation. So discomfort is good. Get comfortable with the discomfort. But you have to practice. It's a learned thing. Take responsibility. Learn how to be an ally. Learn about issues like toxic masculinity, which really limit the ability for men to contribute to their full potential. Check your privilege, check your own biases. Every time I walk into a room, I look around and I say, does this look like one of my classes at Ryerson? Does this look like downtown Toronto? Does this look like, you know, my community? I always do that, I always look. Ask who's not in the room, ask who hasn't had a voice. Listen and believe. Learn, it's a practice, you have to learn it, how to create an inclusive environment so people can be their best, bring their best. And this leads to the best, science. And science tells us this. Tons more information at my website there, ryerson.ca, EDI STEM, some of the wonderful interactions I've had with various people over the years, and thank you very much for this opportunity.